welcome to the KFIC Cafe. It is I, JT. And Jay. And we are going to begin with today's podcast episode with a shout out to Charlie Nimbus 13, who reached out to us on YouTube and emailed us their story. And we've just been talking over Google Hangouts about things he needs help with. He has two chapters he shared with us so far, and we plan to get to them after we finish looking over Jersey Blank Theorist stories. Um, we've been primarily talking about how to enhance the story, how to make it unique, how to make it stand out from all the other stereotypical tropes and story ideas that you see on Wattpad. So looking forward to working with you, Charlie Nimbus 13. Look forward to seeing reading your story soon. Before we hop into today's topic, um, we do want to make reference to a situation that has occurred occur ooh, on English. Wattpad. <laughs> um, so recently, Wattpad has been hacked, and some of the users, if not all, have been, I, I guess, hacked and pwned. Pwned. So someone has hacked into Wattpad, got into everybody's information, and is currently selling it, supposedly on the black market. And information does include email address, date of birth, gender, IP address, profile display name, account name, uh, passwords, potentially, uh, responses to surveys, lists of uh, stories or chapter titles, and third-party accounts that are linked to Wattpad. Mm -hmm. And to find out if you've been puned. Why do you say uh, puned? I, I literally it's... see it as puned. <laughs> I see a W. Pwned. <laughs> but um, if you want to make sure you didn't get pwned, you can go to haveibeenpwned.com. That is H-A-V-E-I-B-E-E-N-P-W-N-E-D.com. And you just put in your email, and it should tell you whether you've been pwned or not. I've been pwned. And I have to. Ah, yeah. So um, some steps. I am actually looking at a, um, a book that Susan Cheetah, shout out to Susan Cheetah, uh, if you're listening to this. Um, she made, she, I think it's a she. She has created a book called Information on Wattpad Hacked with all of the information that she has and she just compiled everything on there. Um, so to prevent being hacked, she suggests changing your password regularly changing the information on your Wattpad account to be wrong. And again, go to the site, have you, have I, was it have I been pwned? Yeah, have I been pwned.com to see if you've been hacked. Um, and then you can know whether you need to change out your password or anything. She also, in the second chapter, inc includes a method to get unpwned and to secure information. It's a Twitter feed that um, helped her get unpwned. I'm unpwned now too. Mm. Are you unpwned now, Jay? Yeah, I went to the uh, second site. Yeah. So first you check if you've been pwned on the website that we've mentioned multiple times. Change your Gmail or whatever email you use that is linked to Wattpad. Um, just make sure you change your password, your email password. Go to Wattpad. Change the email you inserted in there with a fake one, which you, I don't think you have to do because I didn't do that. Uh, make sure you remove access with Wattpad on security Google account if you have a Gmail that you're using. And then go to haveibeenpwned.com slash opt out. And then you just put in your email and you opt out of those lists and those websites. And if you do all that, supposedly it should remove your, you should also click on remove email from public searchability. And that should be able to make you unpwned. And if you're not completely sure, just go back to haveibeenpwned.com and just put in your email again, just to make sure. Um, supposedly that should work. Um, it says it worked for me. I think it worked just for um, safety's sake. Just make sure you change your password and I hope nothing bad happens. One thing I also plan on doing is taking my story and then just saving it all onto a Google doc so I don't lose any of it. So this week's topic is organic character development. JT, you have a quote of the week for us? Yes, we do. And it's from Helen Keller. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Um, we will talk about it a lot in depth later in the podcast, but essentially, and it just also goes for like, not just characters, fictional characters, but it's also like 
your character as well, like in real life, like your morality, your your sense of morals, ethics, um, what makes you you, and you sometimes hear this in like uh, lectures, philosophical <laughs> lectures. I don't know what you may be up to, but like you hear like your character is very upright or something like that, and we are no different than those characters because things aren't happy-go-lucky, everything, you become a better person just by pure luck, I guess you could say. You have to undergo certain experiences for better or for worse. They might be good ones or they might be bad ones, but whatever you experience and whatever things you are exposed to during these like circumstances or whatever, it helps you become a different person in the end. You undergo these experiences and you come out the other end, a changed person, you see things in a different way, and it's only through trial and suffering and that you can actually grow and that it pushes you to become a different person or to see things in a different way. All right. So first things first, what is character development? Character development is just the creation slash the process of building a unique 3D character that has depth, that has personality, that has clear motivations, you know, and so it's you can also think of it as the changes that the, that the character undergoes throughout the story as a result of their actions, interactions, and their experiences and what they undergo during the story as well. And a well-developed character needs a full backstory, personality traits reflective of it, realistic actions and emotions, along with being highly relatable to the average reader and as complex as a real person. If you can't imagine your characters as a real person, they're not quite complex enough to be well developed. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's one of the most appealing parts about characters themselves is the closer you can relate to them, then the deeper the bond you develop with them. That's how you get invested in certain characters. That's why people fall in love with certain characters. People dress up at them at Comic Cons or whatever, and et cetera, et cetera. You grow to love the character, but that only happens when you, you create a realistic character. If yours is just too, um, too unrealistic, not relatable, then there's no connection. And then the reader can care less. And then now you've just created a character that people just skim over. You don't remember them, you know? Mm. And so that being said, that makes character development super important, right? Because a novel essentially is a character undergoing all these different events over a series of time. So the character and plot, I know there are some people who think of them as two separate entities. So like in terms of movies, they're like, people say like there's character dependent movies or plot dependent movies. I beg to differ. I think they both interlace with one another because plot is essentially, it's, it's, it's pretty much what a person is doing in a certain event. That's what a plot is. And so they both build on one another and you can't really have one without the other. And so character development is super important because if you don't understand what, they, what they're like, what they value or what they're afraid of, then you can't really appreciate the significance of the events that they're undergoing if you don't understand them well enough. And then the story loses its impact and then it becomes dull and boring. So of course, to make them real, make them be like you or people that you know, right? Fictional characters have hobbies, they have pets, they have their own pasts, they have their own traumas, they have their own obsessions and their passions. And these are very small characteristics that aren't mentioned in the story, but they're inferred by the way the characters act or how they speak or how they um, play around with other characters, how they interact with other characters, how they do certain things in certain circumstances, etc. But it just tells them, tells your reader how your character reacts and how they feel about the things that are around them. So it's very, very critical in your story that you understand almost everything. You should be able to understand everything about your character, all their aspects, so that you understand how they will react under the pressure of the different events that they will encounter. It can be something as small as like public speaking, or it could be something as big as like, I don't know, global war or something. I don't know. But the point is 
they will react. Every single character should react differently to some degree. Right. Yes. So how does character development affect story? So like, just like I said, plot and character are practically interwoven together. They can't exist one without the other. And so essentially in the plot, the main goal of the main character is what sets the stakes in the story. It doesn't matter whether it's a very, very big thing to you or a small thing to you, as long as it means something very, very important to your protagonist, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be, he's gonna go save, save the world, but it could be something small. They're just trying to protect their family, uh, save their family from eviction, fighting to keep their business from going bankrupt or something. The, the whole idea is our job as the writer is to establish what is important to the reader. And it's something that the audience, the reader should be able to appeal to and understand as well. And it is our job as writers to help the readers imagine what might happen if they lose that important thing. And so with, when that is threatened, then you really see the character, how are they gonna react in that situation? And that's what drives the story forward. And of course, there are so many, so many different types of characters and Jay's gonna break some of them down for you right now. All right, so the first type is the protagonist, which most people confuse with being the good guy, but ultimately a protagonist is someone who goes on a journey, who is affected by the what's going on in the story. The protagonist is essentially the focus that the entire events revolve around. Yeah. Yeah. Next you have the antagonist, which is not always the villain, but they their morals and beliefs would oppose the protagonist, oppose their mission. Then you have these secondary characters, which are side characters that can either add fitness to the story or, you know, maybe just a friend the character goes to. Then you have static characters who don't go, uh, uh, oh, sorry, who doesn't undergo any changes throughout the story. This could really be like a teacher, like someone who just passes their knowledge on to the protagonist, but doesn't really change their morals because like they're already defined. Then you have foil characters who contrast from another character. This tends to be the villain type. Then you have stock characters who are the stereotypical ones. Maybe they're like those angsty teens people like to write about, etc. Those. Or bullies. The bullies. Oh, oh, yes. A lot yeah. of bullies. Ooh. I don't know what's what everybody writes about bullies these days. And loser main characters. Mm. Let's see, bullies. The populars. But I mean, like, all schools of populars. Yeah. I guess that can count as stock. The tech kid. Well, no, not every school has a tech kid. I'm trying to think of stories that have, like, the annoying uh, stocks. <laughs> the twice ones. I always find G Heal as, like, the, the mom school, <laughs> school president school president mm -hmm. you always have like one idol as the school president somewhere in there oh well i like to be school yeah. president one day <laughs> it's too late though <laughs> <laughs> and then you got the um dynamic characters which undergoes the changes they're different from what was i static ones it's, they're opposites so to say they're growing with the main character as they yeah. progress and so there are like so many steps help grow, enrich, or organically enrich your characters. Uh, step one for us that we thought about was creating a background for a character. What is their past, you know? And essentially what a backstory is for people who, are not, who don't know is a backstory is more or less an overview of the character's past that goes beyond the, the story that, the, that, that is given to you in the story. All right, and one good example, or really, it's not really one good example, but if you're a really big fan of anime, those bat stories, especially the action ones, they're always bat stories, especially for those, like, hardcore fans who watch Naruto. Maybe you watch, let's see, Bleach is a good one. Really, a lot, pretty much all action animes have a bat story or have a reason why the protagonist is the way they are. Ooh. That sounds terrible. <laughs> the reason why the protagonist is the way they... How do you even word that? Was it right the first time? It's the way they are. It's the way it is. It's, it, it pretty much helps explain why do they behave in the way they behave. 
Yeah. For example, you might have characters who are reluctant to help the main character because of a trauma they had in the past. Mm. And then I guess a common stock that you would see is you have uh, the characters, they need to get to somewhere or they need to get something. And the person, only person that can help them is... Uh, depressed or they are suffering traumatically from something in some way that prevents them from wanting to help and then a stereotype would be they unintentionally say something that kind of triggers something in that person and they'd be like you know what I changed my mind I'll help you now you know Mm. what I mean so that's just a stock that I see please don't do that it is overused and it's so boring and it just feels like a MacGuffin you just keeps it's just there to help the story move forward and doesn't really accomplish much aside from throwing a little backstory there but essentially these backstories are crucial to character development and character creation and this helps the authors us as the writers to help to get a stronger sense of what this character is like and these backstories is what and kind of it's the secret unseen causes and reasons for the actions that you see of the characters in the actual story themselves uh i mean i don't really know how else to explain it but like backstories there is no really set way to write a backstory and there are so many different ways to make one but whatever it comes out as a detailed backstory that helps dictate like explain the character and what they are like is essential to world building and it can help authors us writers create these characters that resemble real people with genuine realistic um, um, personality traits Um, for some ways I guess to come up with um, your own backstory is just brainstorm some story ideas Uh, maybe explore through other stories that you've seen or just jot as much as you can document something from a character's childhood you should be able to know everything that happened to them from their childhood to um, the, and the long-term goals that they wanted then and what happened to them until the point you've reached now in the point of the narrative and it's also very important to know that nobody should really know about this background except for you and this background is what informs their character's personality and their point of view how they see the world And this is kind of like behind the scenes kind of thing that you don't really get to know about, that the readers don't get to know about. And that is just what helps create that realistic feeling of an organically developed character. Um, Some other thing in it, some other things you can think about is, you know, the traits that the characters might have and that you've already created for your character maybe. And, just think about what past events may have influenced your character to have those traits. And so if you work backwards in this case, you have a justification for the choices that this character makes and kind of gives you the whole story of the character's experience as well. Um, In terms of utilizing it in your writing, you could, depending, depending on, it really depends on your story. So the backstory could lead and generate the narrative right so it's like i guess you could think of as a prequel or a prelude to the entire main story that the readers don't actually get to see and so i know there are some writers who like to find strong characters that they've created and then create a plot revolving around them and so then that would be you create a backstory and that leads to the creation of the actual plot the actual narrative um so as you develop this character then you'll start to find the relationships with other characters, different themes that you might want to explore. And so you just follow these threads and then you connect the dots and then you create a narrative. But the whole thing starts with the creation of a character, right? There's also, you can use um, flashbacks, but I see a way too much of that in Wattpad stories. They're so overused and it's kind of like really it's really kind of willy-nilly just tossed out there with not really an an objective around it. Um, If you do want to use flashbacks, it is important that it is a very comprehensive understanding of your character's backstory because time jumps can be disorienting if the author, if the writer 
has like a timeline for these characters. But if you want to know your character's past inside and out, you'll have to be able to create these flashbacks that reveal important character details. And most importantly, it has to be able to advance the plot. It has to exist for a reason. And I guess these narratives may stretch out for years and years, depending on like the, how the timeline is formatted. And if you're creating like a super long series like this, then you have to have, have a comprehensive background for not just your primary characters, but your secondary characters. You can think about this in like Harry Potter. Harry Potter, you have kind of like in the very beginning, he was influenced by his past as the boy under the cupboard. And from there, everything that the protagonist Harry Potter does is influenced by his past. And so when we start the series with him at the Dudleys, is it the Dudleys? Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just remember Dudley was one of those three. <laughs> You'll have to double check for me. But anyway, his past with his um, extended family. Then you find out that he, as you progress along, more information about his backstory is revealed along the way. And this is done with other um, characters as well, like Ron and Hermione and Draco. And so it's all kind of progressive and it just kind of helps move along with the story. You better understand the characters and it helps you better understand the plot. And then it helps you better understand the characters and all of them just help each other in turn coming out in the end as like a beautifully well enriched story. Yeah. It's, I think it's Dursley. Dursley. Dursley? Yeah. Dudley Dudley is one of the characters. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Well, you know what I meant? The Dursley, the Dursley family. (laughs) Now, step two, know your character's strengths and weaknesses. All right, so first thing you want to do is give your characters the right skills. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, Ari the Khan stories, sir? I see you use a oh, lot oh, of the oh, yeah. strengths and weaknesses in there. That's right. Um, so in my story of Art of the Khan, I essentially created the team based on specific, I guess you could say, jobs in the team. So you have the mastermind, the guy who creates the whole plot, that would be the main character. You have the hacker, which is a very specific skill set. It's very techy, uh, very, um, I guess, modern aged thinking, I guess you could call it. And that was Zhong Yun. What's, what else was there? There was, um, there was the hitman. The hitman, that one was Jenny. So a, a bit more violent, a bit more aggressive. And then you have Da Hyun, which is a bit of an actress. She pretends to. Uh, she's you're selling she's selling something that she's definitely not um you have rosé which is kind of like the pickpocket slash very dexterous kind of skills lock picking uh those kind those kind of things and you have v who is more large scale infiltration so like breaking into buildings etc so all of these skills although they exist in the crime underworld you don't really have one character who is not like criminal superman who knows how to do all these things right so because like learning how to do these things takes time takes effort takes work you have to understand it you have to be able to comprehend it to be to be to be an actual expert in that specific thing so it doesn't make sense that someone knows how to do all of them so you have the main character who's the mastermind and he recruits all these other people with these skill sets to use them in the overall heist um, we do find out later that he, the main character does uh, have some skill in everything else to a limited degree, but essentially it's you, the other p- people with the right skill sets are, I guess you could say, masters. They know what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. So in terms of development, they need to know the right sub. They, they need to know the right things in order for thing for the, for the plot to move along, because you sent everyone has a role in the heist. You have one person who's lookout. You have one person who's making sure everything goes along. You got the inside man. You got the person who's coming in from the outside, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different factors that are happening, and there are so many skill sets that you need. And so these skills, I guess, in a way, could reflect. The personalities of these characters why do you think they might i don't ever talk about this in my stories or allude to it but it's just something fun to think about what do you th- why do you think they these certain characters chose these roles i haven't really given it much thought now that we're talking about this but like in terms of you know skills they picked them for a reason and so i don't know where i'm going with this <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. What about you? Um, I actually have two good uh, examples. One of them is coming from my idol project that I've been working on for like, the past what, three to four months now. Um, and I actually feel pretty close with this topic this week because I'm currently using like character development as I outline the story and I'm like emphasizing certain characteristics of my character. So when it comes down to his personality, yes, his, some of his strengths is that how supportive he is. He's very patient. He's hardworking, loyal, like some good characteristics. And then you have his weaknesses. Sometimes he could be humble and shy. Uh, he takes things too personally. He tends to repress his feelings. And one of the main things, since I'm already spilling the tea a little bit, um, <laughs> is that he's a really good dancer. And I wanted to make him like a, a star training and everything. But I was like, that's really not interesting. So I, I did some research on certain K-pop idols and came to figure out that some of the best dancers in the industry tend to start off with not having really good vocals. So I kind of made the protagonist in that way to where he's a good dancer, but not a good vocal. And then another example that just came to mind was Aang from Avatar. And in this entire episode, you just want to keep hearing about this, about Avatar, because I just got done watching the show. But um, Aang, you know, he's 12 years old. He's the Avatar. And being the Avatar has its strengths. Many people look up to him and all that good stuff. But it also is a weakness because you got the Fire Nation who's actually after him, who's trying to, like, kill him so they could take over the entire world. So that pretty much feeds into having strengths with things, have weaknesses. He's an airbender, so he's able to, like, do stuff with wind, obviously. But his weakness is that he doesn't know any of the other elements. And he has to learn them in a certain period of time. So those weaknesses is pretty much what guides the story. So, yeah. All right. Step three, creating nervous tics or habits. Yeah. I mean, every normal human being has, when they're nervous or they get fidgety, they always do something. Uh, I am very, very, very guilty of this. Um, if anyone has been paying very close attention, if you listen to our past podcast, you can hear me shuffling cards in the background. That is my form of fidgeting or I mean, like, I don't have a fidget spinner and I just shuffle cards mindlessly. I can do it for hours just shuffling and I'm trying my best in this episode not to do it. Um, <laughs> I've distanced myself, but like, yeah, nervous habits. Everybody has, when they're nervous or they're anxious or when certain, under circumstances, certain circumstances, they will do things that may not be normal, but it's a nervous tick or a nervous habit for them. I'm a very, very fidgety person. I'm like border ADD. So I have like so many different things on here. I have a rubber band, which uh, that I've been told that you can hear through the camera. I have coins, which I'm afraid to drop and that'll make a large sound. I already dropped a coin earlier. I'm not sure if you heard that. And then I have cards that I picked up and started shuffling and now I put it back down because I really have to stop doing that. I mean, everybody, when they're nervous, they do something. I'm pretty sure Jay does something when he's nervous too. I go on an entire tangent from the topic. I get, it's like, it's like a defense mechanism. Honestly, if you, if you take in psychology, one of the main defense mechanisms to like anxiety and nervousness is that we tend to talk more and we tend to talk faster. And that's pretty much one of the most common nervous tics or nervous habits any of us could have. Now, please don't do that for all your characters because monologues, this isn't Shakespeare, yes. but it's, it's sometimes okay sometimes. <laughs> Just know that your characters are not perfect beings. We actually do stuff that might be weird, but that makes us who we are, I guess, in a way. But it has to be justified. All the things that I do is very magic related. Cards, coins, rubber bands, poker chips, um, Rubik's cubes. I don't know. I'm, I'm fidgeting with all of these and that kind of just helps to reflect what I am. Nail biting, scratching the nose, uh, your leg bounces up and down. These are all nervous tics and particularly common ones that I hear a lot of. Um, yeah, just hey, helps your characters become more relatable, makes them human, I guess. And that also bleeds into step number four. No character is perfect. They have to have flaws. I mean, 
I think it's a given, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I don't like us. I don't always like a main character who's like Superman. They can do everything. They can't lose. Uh, and you see this especially in like old movies, like super, was it Superhuman Syndrome, Superhero Syndrome. Basically, in all these like fight outs, the main character doesn't get like a single scratch. You may also notice these inconsistencies in like. Um, characters with bows and arrows they have unlimited arrows un- unrealistically or some guy with a gun is just shooting he's not even reloading half the time and that's just boring they're too invincible and that also just turns into if they're too good then what's the point in rooting for them if i already know they're going to win in the end and that's true that also goes to you have to give them a flaw in in, in some way uh and because great characters come out of trials that they encounter and believable characters have like human flaws, just like people in their life. We're not perfect. They're not perfect. And that's just what makes it interesting. You watch them struggle with these flaws and you see them try to figure out how to turn that flaw and overcome it and then overcome the obstacle despite their flaws. Right. Mm-hmm. And you could, a lot of this stuff, since we are the K-Fit Cafe, now K stands for K-pop, um, you could really <laughs> look into your favorite artists. Not all of them are all around, you know, idols. They lack in certain areas. Some of them propel in certain areas. And so let's say Lay from EXO. I love Lay, man. But, um... <laughs> He's a good dancer, good vocalist, but you, and he's also the main dancer along with Kai. But the thing is that people don't know is that in order for him to be such a good dancer, he spends hours, literally, if he wanted to, he could probably spend days in the practice room learning the choreography, like, you know, going over it multiple times. He actually, I believe he said this in an interview once, that he spends a lot of time learning things. It's not that he's a slow learner, but he knows that's a weight to it. And, you know, in order to maintain that main dancer position, you want to keep doing your best. You want to keep practicing, make sure it's perfect. He's also a perfectionist. I'm sure a lot of my old SOL fans, ooh, no, SOLs are aware of that. And I believe that's one of the uh, flaws is that he wasn't always a good dancer. Tae Young, Tae Young from NCT. He also wasn't a good dancer at first. His teacher literally said she was going, he or she was going to give up on him. And I felt that. And so he had to overcome his lack of dancing. Now look at him. He's a main dancer and a sinner. And you know what? He's a main rapper too. So yeah, use some flaws. <laughs> and we're all flawed. I mean, I'm, I'm flawed. I have perfect pitch or highly developed relative pitch. And so because of that, When I was younger, um, I was told by my mom, who was a music professor at a college, um, that I had a very, I had a very solid soprano voice, which I did not have, do not have now because puberty hit and (laughs) now my voice is super deep. But um, essentially I can, although I have a limited vocal range, I can hit, I, I believe I can hit accurately the notes in tune um which i know a lot of k-pop idols have problems with but in any case like that's just one of my strengths in terms of weaknesses and flaws i can't dance to save my life i don't <laughs> understand how to, how how your body moves to do stuff like my my limbs don't understand how you <laughs> dance it doesn't make sense it literally makes no sense to me i have two younger sisters both of them takes um dance uh they're part of they're both part of dance teams which makes me look somewhat bad. <laughs> but if, I mean, just if you look at it, it's just a personality, it's just a character thing. I don't know how to dance, but I can probably sing or do music really well. I know Jay can dance, All right, Jay? Break it down. Look at him go, he's, Break going, it down. <laughs> he's, going, he's going on the podcast. I actually just learned two new uh, dances yesterday. See, look at him. He's learning <laughs> dances. He's look at him go. Look at him go. Thank you. Yeah, but we're all flawed. Your character—that means your character should be flawed too. 
<clears throat> now that takes us to step five. All characters need realistic motives. Mm-hmm. The first thing that when I when we was writing these things, these this whatever you want to call it outline was Harry Potter and he who should not be named Voldemort. So, what did I just say? What did I just say? <laughs> God, they're not going to die. Okay, anyway, he's dead anyway. He's already dead. So, and if you're just now getting to Harry Potter from the outside, it really just looked like just looks like Voldemort wants to kill Harry Potter for just the sake of killing him. But if you read it, you understand the movie and everything, you understand that he's only out there, Harry, instead of the entire academy. Because prophe- uh, prophecy said that Harry will be the one who kills him. And so that's actually a realistic motive. I mean, if I find out JT is set out to kill me, I want to fight him too. Like, what? <laughs> or, like, kill him now so that way before, yeah. I, before I get him, I can't yeah. fulfill that prophecy. Exactly. And, like, there's so many movies that follow realistic motivations. We talked about this. Uh, I, I, was it, I think it was last podcast i don't remember but we talked about one once of dead men tell no not dead men tell them, was dead man's chest and how you have all of these characters looking to get this one item but they all have different reasons to find it jack sparrow is looking for the chest because he wants to use it to control davy jones and so he won't die Davey, uh you got will turner who wants to find it because he wants to get his father off the flying dutchman and kill Davy Jones. You got the Admiral, I still don't remember his name, who wants the chest so he can control Davy Jones and end piracy in the seas. You got Commodore Norrington, who wants to find the chest and give it to the Admiral so he can restore his honor. And then you have Davy Jones, who's kind of on the other end of the things. He wants to get to it so nobody else can use it to threaten him. So you see all these characters have different motives, and all of these motives are for different reasons. And that just goes to show each one of them has something different in mind. Jack Sparrow, Jack Sparrow and Davy Jones, they're looking for survival. Um, Will Turner is more selfless. He's doing it for his father. So a little bit out of filial piety. Uh, and then you have Commodore Norrington and the Admiral who are doing it for their own causes as well. Um, another thing in terms of uh, giving them realistic motives is more, give the, your, your antagonist morality. So the villain's motivations should be in contrast to what the protagonist wants. So every villain has their own, and they need to have their own morality, no matter how warped it seemed. And so if you have a bad guy who's spending parts of the novels killing people, give them a valid reason for doing so. Make the reader understand what desperate need or twisted philosophy has driven this villain to commit these crimes, right? And then make these motivations personal to their history and how they were raised. One example is in the recent year, Avengers. You have Thanos, and I'm pretty sure at this point everyone should have seen Infinity War, but you have Thanos who has the belief that because the universe is overpopulating, it's gonna cause um, an incredible imbalance in the scale of the universe and it'll cause um, starvation, overpopulation, just a lot of bad things. And so using that as justification, he thinks to eliminate half of the popul- half of the world, half of the universe through random, unbiased selection to eliminate half of the universe. And in his eyes, this is just, this is fair. He is saving hundreds of lives and by balancing the scale of the universe. Now, if you look at it from uh, the Avengers' point of view and the audience's point of view, we're against that because it just sounds like mass genocide, right? So he has a, his morality leads him and it drives him to seek these stones and pull off this thing because that is what he believes he needs to do. Another example, um, a long, long time ago, Monsters Incorporated. You have Henry Waternoos, the CEO of Monsters, Inc., who runs a company that collects children's screams to power their city. And if you have seen it, you understand that there is an energy crisis going on. They're not getting as many screams as they can in the past because 
children are getting harder and harder to scare by these days. And so as a result, um, it becomes a big twist in the end that he is actually kidnapped. He's trying to kidnap children and artificially extract screams from them to power the, the city. Now, of course, if you look at it from a bigger, big, big picture point of view, he's doing it so that way he can pr still provide energy for the city. He's doing it because he's trying to protect and he's trying to help, continue helping the people of the, mo of the monsters, the, the, mo the, the city of monsters. And, but if you look at it from uh, Sully and Mike Wazowski's point of view and Boo's, it is inhumane and you sh it shouldn't be done because it's just not a morally good thing to do. But you have the, that's what these contrasting moralities do to these characters. It causes one of them who has this very strong belief that he's doing the right thing and another one that thinks they're doing the right thing as well. And they clash against each other because they're not the same thing. While our news police, he's helping the energy crisis by um, kidnapping a child and artificially replicating screams. Soli just wants to bring her back home and put her back where she belongs. And so they clash together. And that's what creates that tension between the antagonist and the protagonist. And that's what creates a really good, well, really well created bad guy, I guess you could say. All right. And I actually have two more examples on moralities. First one, as I warned you all before, came from Avatar. All right. <laughs> so as we all know, the Fire Nation wants to get Aang with the Avatar so they could take over the entire world by the time the comet comes. Now, there are two different, there are two people from the Fire Nation who have similar view, similar views of getting the Avatar, but for different reasons. First, you have Zuko, who wants to get Aang. I, I believe he wants to kill him, too. I'm not really sure. If it was he, captured unless, in the beginning. He was oh, yeah. after the capture. Yeah, he wants to capture him to basically restore his honor with his father. Because, you know, <laughs> that story, he was exiled. And then you have Fire Lord Ozai, who wants to get the Avatar, just so he wouldn't get in his way and learn all the elements and stop him from taking over the world. And then the second one, which this technically doesn't have an antagonist, but have you ever seen this K-drama called The Sentence of the Sun, featuring Sun Hee Kyo and Sun Jong Ki? Dang, JT, you need to get out there, bro. I don't watch K-dramas that much. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, um, Sun Hee Kyo, she plays a doctor who her morals are to save lives. And it's Sun Jong Ki. I'm pretty sure I'm butchering their names. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but he's a, what is he, like a, command, a military commander or something like that? And, you know, his mission is to take lives to defend his country so these difference in morals actually creates the conflict in their relationship that some romantic tension and i just find that something to put in there since we're talking about motives so yeah step six give each character a unique feature and in this case it's just help create a memorable character create things that will hate help make your characters so much more memorable the moment you mention this one feature you know exactly who that is a classic example harry potter the moment you see those circular glasses you know harry potter it's got to be him mm -hmm. that, and that and it's just that memorable you can remember him super easily remember him super fast and that's what makes them so interesting and so that, that that's just those are just physical uh features um what about uh personal uh internal features interests you know maybe somebody who does uh, who enjoys doing a certain uh activity the moment you hear that you also know ah it's this person you know and so um to, to develop characters like this the easiest way i find is create a character that reflects your own personal interests things that you like because your in your internal passion for this subject will come out and it will blend into that character and so then in that way that character also holds that same passion for that same activity um and so you can also in terms of like physical features or any type of feature at all just be able to just be able to describe them so that and in a way that way you can reveal the world 
through details and then it becomes clear for the readers to understand and comprehend. Mm -hmm. And as always, we're the K-Fit Cafe, K-Pop. Some of these unique features, you know, Young of Twice, she has dimples. Mm -hmm. um, well, at least uh, she's known, then, at least she in particular is known for it. Yeah. And then you have Mina who has a very quiet kind of voice. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Hmm. We tend to mention twice Sana, a lot. Sana is very flirtatious. She's a snake. <laughs> I, I hate snake. Um, see, there, are, there are other characteristics of other people too. Can't think um, of them right now. Maybe, well, that's another one, but it actually feeds into a later step, so I'll mention that later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, make him unique features. Harry Potter's scar. Maybe someone mm -hmm. has a different skin tone than everybody. Maybe somebody has two different color eyes. The Weasley like, family with their yeah. red hair. Mm hmm Was it red Ooh. hair? I think it was red hair. I think so. Mm hmm Naruto was a good one too. With they um with the different clans. They had like the the different bands. Yeah. Yeah, headbands too. <laughs> yeah, that's a, you get a lot of unique characteristics from stuff. Though they inspiration. Mm -hmm. And it just helps create something memorable. The mm -hmm. moment you see these certain objects, you think of that character. Everybody knows, I'm sure everybody knows of that V Life where Sana was wearing circular glasses and someone said she looked like Harry Potter. You have an idol right there, you see the glasses, you immediately think Harry Potter, right? And that's mm -hmm. just a memorable, memorable character right there. I normally associate circular, like actual circle glasses with Korean like fashion style, but you still can't help but also think it's Harry Potter. It's a Harry Potter thing, right? So, mm -hmm. also a fun thing. Sana Pota. <laughs> right. Step seven, develop a wide variety of personality types. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, let's see. My, the Myers-Briggs has 16 different personality types, and so everybody kind of falls underneath one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I know Twice kind of had like a video series on each one taking the ex the test and finding their personality types, even though some of them may not reflect them as they think they are. I, I, when I took it, I think it is very, very accurate, at least in my opinion. It is very, very me, at least. Um, I do have some overlap with one or two of the Twice members, but you know, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> a very false, very poor false hope right there. But the point is, there's so many different personality types. You, you know, I, I, I did not expect Sana to be the only extrovert in the group. I expected, Honestly. Yeah, I expected um, so many more to be extroverted, but she is the only one. Everyone else is introverted. And so it's just that there's so many different personality types out there. Um, so you can look at, you can look for this in, fr in different friends. They, they will have different personalities. I'm sure Jay has a different personality than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, everyone has a different personality and everybody should not be like the same copy of the same character. And they all look, they are, they all sound identical. They all feel identical. Diversify it, make them feel more, feel, feel different from one another, you know? And since we mentioned Myers and Briggs, no, not what was it? Myers, 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 and... Myers Briggs. Okay, I'm like, oh, just trying to think about a TV show for a second. Um, I actually have two personality types. What? Um, yeah, remember I had mentioned before, huh? I'm gonna get how does this it. work? So, <laughs> during my first term in college, I take I took psychology, and we were all supposed to take the Myers and Briggs, what well, Myers Briggs personality test. I'm actually ISTJ, which is a logistician. Logistician? Yeah, Logistician. That. and I'm Whatever. also uh, ISFJ. And I, that means I display both char like characteristics from both personality types. I guess you say I'm dual natured. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, if you're interested in taking one of these personality tests, just go to 16personalities.com. And you can take a free test on there to figure out what your type is. Um, I, in a way, I am also dual personality as well. I'm just like on the border between the two of them. 
And so I'm INFPT and INFJT, which is um, the advocate and the mediator. Uh, and these are all kind of like, I guess, peacemakers. And these are all the introverted parts of the diplomat class category in the thing, which is interesting. <laughs> also, a good a note um, when you take the test, the trick is to not, to make sure you get the right personality type or actual, your actual personality type. Do not mm -hmm. think about the question. Like, immediately check the first thing that comes to mind. That's the best way you're going to get the mm -hmm. right results. Because the only way to get an accurate personality test isn't if you think of it, like, contemplate on it. It has to be innate. Like, where do you think you are? And you have to be very, very dead honest with yourself to accurately find your thing. Because if you go in thinking, oh, I think I'm an extroverted kind of person, then you're going to be thinking, oh, I should pick all the ones that will make me look intro extroverted. Mm -hmm. Right? So you really have to think about it and not, not really think about it. You have to go by instinct because instinct is your gut feeling, which is your very core animalistic impulses to do certain things. And that will help, hopefully help you get a very good, accurate, um, find your accurate personality type more accurately. Mine's is definitely accurate. I could either be aggressive or I could actually think. <laughs> <laughs> you I'll never kill know you or I will enlighten myself. <laughs> Talk no juicy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, step eight. Match your character's history with the effects of it. Something that yeah. gets used too much on I'm about to say on K Fit Cafe on wet pad is trauma. Not now trauma is it depends on the degree. Just because somebody got hit by a car in front of you doesn't mean you're going to be traumatized by it. it That's just it physical varies. trauma. Yeah. Sorry. There are yeah, that's just physical things. trauma. It's not like lifelong kind of thing. Yeah. Like one thing, maybe, I think somebody said this to me the other day about them writing. Um, it's the person, like one of the characters used to be in the military. And, you know, PTSD is one of the common, most common psychological yeah. disorders from there. So I was like, yeah. okay. So you the hard part that. is not saying straight out, oh, I have PTSD. You don't, the people who have these kind of conditions rarely even want to say they are having, they're suffering from these kind of things. But what you can do is show, this, again, we talk about this so many times, show, don't tell. Show them, don't tell me that he has PTSD. They're not going to tell you that. I don't think people will not tell you. Show, show me that he has PTSD. Maybe each time he hears a um, something going into the fryer and making a sizzling sound, he thinks of it as, um, as a bomb threat and he immediately ducks down and takes cover. And it's just these like, again, impulsive with these personalities, their instincts tell them I have to behave in this way. Therefore, they're gonna act in a certain manner. And that's how you have um, a character's history affecting their actions now. Mm. Um, I guess, I'm not sure if I really wanna use this as an example, but oh well. Um, one of the things, and I'm sure that a lot of people may relate is staying up late on your phone when you're supposed to be asleep. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, I, I've talked to my sisters about this, and they have somewhat developed it too. Um, we are able to hear who is walking around the house by the sounds of the footsteps alone. And it's crazy how spot on we are. And like, we can feel, ooh, this part of the staircase, when it goes down this much, it's probably dead. Or <laughs> if it's this, or if it's going up at this speed, it's either gonna be the one of my sisters or it's gonna be my mom or something like that. But the point is you have all these little things that kind of build on top of one another and they develop, I don't know, this skill is never gonna come in handy in the future, but like, <laughs> you know, it's been developed. Mm -hmm. Not much I can do about it, but you know. And a K-pop fact: um, if you're a big fan of SNSD or otherwise called Girls' Generation, one of the members—I actually don't know if she left. I think she's still there. Sunny. Um, she grew up in, I believe, she grew up in Vietnam. And the time she grew up, there was like these—I believe there was terrorist threats, or there like military things going on. What was and, the year? Uh, oh, I have no clue. Because if it was nineteen sixty, late 1960s, early 1970s, that might have been Vietnam War. 
And let me check. Let me check. check. Let me check too. <laughs> it was a night. She was born nineteen eighty nine. Okay, then that was post Vietnam War. Yeah, something was going on, and somebody mentioned it. But and this also kind of feeds into like the bat story and like, maybe nervous ticks and things. Mm-hmm. But something that used to happen is that whenever they would perform and they would shoot fireworks, she would get uh, scared. Like she get extremely frightened. Yeah, but yeah, um, history. But uh, Sonny's thing, from what I'm hearing, that is a bit of a form of PTSD, I mm-hmm. guess you could say. Oh, Sonny was actually born in California. Then she moved to Vietnam. Okay, yeah. just fun facts. I actually suffer from, um, I'm very claustrophobic, at least when I'm in a crowd of people. When I was younger, when a lot of people would gather around, it would usually mean like something bad was about to happen. So I associated those two things together. So I mm. really don't like going to like concerts or anything because I would fear crowds, and I I maybe get over it, but you know, it takes time. But facts. Yeah, I'm trying to think about one for me personally. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have a very irrational fear of the dark. It isn't caused by anything, but growing up, and I still have it now, is I have a very overactive imagination. Like, it's not schizophrenic level, but it's like, I see things out of the corner of my eyes, and I genuinely just scare myself for no apparent reason. When I was writing my first arc for my, for my next, for this next writing project, I was, I've said in the past, like, 1 to 2 a.m. is my writing time, but I had to change it to sometime in the afternoon, because I could not write those sections in the dark. Like, it was pretty bad. (laughs) Uh... But it's not as terrible as you or Sunny, but mm. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, lo- I'm low-key over it. I mean, my senior year, I had to do a performance. Oh, um, that's not bad. Yeah, and it wasn't like I was surrounded by people, so it wasn't the same level. But being in front of a lot of people, it kind of helped me just a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I, I still don't like crowds. I, they're just, no. Anyways, back to the uh, the, the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Where are we? What even are we? I think we're in step nine. All right. Step nine, make secondary characters foil types. Um, so just a so, reminder, foil mm-hmm. types, fo- foil type characters are characters that contrasts from another one, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, foil types, the whole point of them being contrasted, I think, from my understanding so far, is that this contrast is there to help the protagonist uh, overcome certain obstacles. And so these foil type characters can either be um, some secondary characters who exist to, as opposition in a way to the, um, to the main character, to the protagonist. They can also be the villain, um, in which case um, you should always make the villain much more powerful than the protagonist because then now he's a genuine threat and it isn't something just that's really much of a pushover. And because it's so the antagonist is so powerful, now that forces your protagonist to find the skills or the items or the people that they need to ally themselves against the antagonist to be able to defeat them. And it pushes them to find solutions to overcome the antagonist as an obstacle. And that in itself helps further character development as well. Um, so, a good example in terms of secondary, oppositional secondary uh, characters is the famous Sherlock Holmes and Watson. If you watch Sherlock, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, or the uh, the, the movie, the movie, the Sherlock Holmes movies starring Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law, you can see, in a way, uh, Doctor Watson acting as the oppositional secondary character. He's kind of like the nagging mother who just kind of tells them, stop doing these things. You're going to get hurt. You're going to hurt yourself. Uh, This isn't good for you. And the protagonist is just kind of like rolling their eyes and they're trying to ignore them or something like that. But it's kind of, kind of like in a positive way, being in opposition. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the only, I can think of it most clearly from the Robert Downey Jr. ones, uh, you have uh, Jude Law, who's just constantly, please clean up after yourself. Your place looks like a mess. It looks like someone died here. Did, why, why are you killing my dog? Which, dog doesn't die, don't worry. 
Um, <laughs> but point is, these oppositional characters help enrich and push the, the protagonists to be better people in one form or another. Mm -hmm. That's just one example. My example will once again come from Avatar. I'm sorry, I know you guys are tired of it, but it has to. It has to happen. Um, so two characters who are like foil types to one another. Well, a foil type character in Avatar would be Zuko, and his personality is the opposite of Aang. Zuko believes the best way to do things in the beginning of the show is to be aggressive, assert dominance, like be just everything, just evil. And Aang's, his is to see things peacefully, to try to settle things with talking first rather than violence, unlike Zuko. Another way, which these probably won't be considered foil characters, but if you remember, um, it's a little brief spoiler, in the third season, when Avatar has to figure out how to defeat Ozai, he talks with the other Avatars, and they often mention that you would have to kill them or something. And so he has to overcome this fact that he doesn't want to kill Ozai. He just want to stop him from doing what he's doing. So by overlooking what they're telling him to do, he develops a way to stop Ozai, which is to take away his bending. And, you know, full types in stories and full types in shows, movies, they really add the tenderness that is the plot because it gives the main character something that it creates the antagonist for the main character. It gives them someone who is going to go against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just further warning, we will be referencing Avatar The Last Bender a lot in this episode. I love it. I love it. <laughs> who doesn't? <laughs> All right. Step 10, giving each character a distinct voice. And so there's so many different ways that you can go about this. You can go in accents or language or catchphrases. You have, Nar you have Naruto uh, and you know slash believe it. It's his signature catchphrase, you know. You have Zuko all about, I must restore my honor. Yeah. Everybody, everybody, knows, everybody knows it. And, and, and it's basically, it characterizes the, the character as well. Um, uh in terms of accents there are like regional uh accents i guess even a way that you could be able to write out but if you're doing like in a korean like in terms of english because i speak english doing like saying something in a british accent or in a korean accent or a chinese accent or whatever i would avoid doing that because then how do you describe that in the future when they talk again? You can't constantly say in a Korean accent, in a Korean accent, in a Korean accent. And I think the best way is to just not have accents, but write out the accents as how they might be pronounced. It could be improper grammar. It could be um, regional because, you know, in America, different places to place, um, people talk differently. Like down, I'm not that far south. But I am far south enough that I instinctively say y'all. <laughs> I don't think anybody in the north really does it that much, but I say y'all a lot in my texts, in my talking, uh, in my writing. And that's just regional. Uh, so it's kind of hard for me to step out <laughs> from that box. But giving each character a distinct voice, some characters might say y'all. That means they're from the south. Some characters may not. Perhaps that means they're from the north. Some of them speak uh, speak the language inc somewhat incorrectly. They're not from around here. And so these little details just give that unique voice. It characterizes them. And then it marks them as a specific, um, they, they only they talk in a certain way, and that's how you recognize them, the way they talk. Maybe they're, they talk in a very joking manner, or they don't take things seriously, or someone is very strict and to the board, and they are very serious about things all the time, or you have someone who's constantly flirting with other people, or it's just the way they talk, it's their voice, and that's just the way they talk. And this isn't also just your external voice, what you can hear, but internal voice, the thoughts of the characters. Uh, this honestly only applies for first person when they do inter internal monologues, um, when they're thinking about something. 
or third person omniscient where you can kind of hear understand or hear the thoughts of the other people but uh having access to that interior voice can also help further understand your character even more for the read from the reader's perspectives at least they will understand why do they think that way how is their uh train of thought going in regards to this matter and so you better under by understanding their voice you understand the personality even more not just their actions but the way they think the way they behave why do they do the things the way they do mm. and uh accents so a little while ago i was in high school still um i read the this series called the nick chronicles which basically followed this guy named Nick. He's from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, he's a demon, apparently, but it's not important. That's not what I'm trying to get at. One character who really stood out to me was his mother. I think her name was Charisse. And whenever she spoke, whenever the author or the writer wrote her dialogue out, she spoke in a way that wasn't really familiar to me. It's because she spoke in the tongue or how we actually say yet. Um, she spoke with a New Orleans accent, which is referred to as yet, which required her, like, when the author wrote out her dialogue, there was a lot of apostrophes, a lot of cuts in with the things she was saying. It really sounded like she was pretty foreign. But no, she was just raised in New Orleans. And for those who live in America, you could really, you really benefit from dialogue or using dialects. accents and things. Yeah, dialects. Because... Like JT mentioned, we're from the South. I'm from the deep South, so I have a stronger country accent than he does. And you but, can probably hear it when we talk, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a really strong country accent. It's not my fault. <laughs> but and I believe you mentioned a little while ago, you think, was Jersey Blinks. Um, mm -hmm. When he um, mentioned, like when you was doing some editing for him. Yeah. Some things you were confused about because he spoke differently because he was further up north than we are. Well, actually, he's from up north. I just found out he lives actually pretty close to where I live. Oh, wow, really? <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> uh, but going back to uh, step 10, um, language. Mm -hmm. And my story, I, my main character, he's bilingual. He speaks both Korean and English simply because his parents are Korean, but he was raised in America. So, you know, at home, he had to speak Korean. At school, he spoke English. Now, we mentioned dialogue tasks before. I think that was episode three. In order to incorporate like a language change, especially for people or characters who knows multiple languages, it's to write in that language, not the Romanized version, because that, that just sucks. And that's it's, lazy as also. Romanization, it's really dumb. As someone who speaks um, in a, another Asian language, it is so inaccurate <laughs> because... <laughs> I guess I speak Mandarin. Like, for example, why is the sh sound marked by an X? <laughs> and it messes up American people. Like, when they see an X, they'll be like, we don't have that in the English language. The only word that starts with an X is a xylophone, which makes a Z sound. And then they butcher it. Uh, so I blame Americans for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no shame, see, for, no shame <laughs> for me, um, since, you know, as I mentioned before, my main character, he speaks Korean and English. I've actually been studying Korean for a good bit of time, and I'm pretty good at writing it. So I already have in my mind that for certain dialogues, when it came to, and I had to di differentiate between certain, like, characters speaking with one another, I was going to incorporate a word in English, like, when he says hi, I was going to write Anyan Haseo, which you know means hello, technically speaking, yeah. Butchered. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's just I, I a just, good indication. I just, I'm just playing with you. It's a really good indication, but if push comes to shove, just write the whole story in English. Don't even worry about the uh, language unless it's a big part of the plot. Yep. Onwards to step number 11. We're almost done. Don't worry, guys. We're almost there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so number 11, create a diverse cast in every way. So that being said, skin tone, eye color, hair color, disabilities, mental illnesses. Um, you, you should try to 
uh, diversified things inside your story. If you look at Hamilton, again, there are very few uh, white actors and those who are white play the, the kind of the opposition in a way. Because um, in one of Lin-Manuel Miranda's, um, uh, in one of his interviews, he talks about how like the whole idea was to show um, how diverse America is and how it is built on all these diverse characters. And so you have to understand not all characters are, um, they're not all of them are going to be white or not all of them are going to be Asian. You have to be able to kind of make it open more open because the whole world isn't just one skin tone, one eye color, one hair color, right? There's going to be other p types of people out there. No, even if you're in Korea, you are bound to run into some w white guy. And if you're in America, especially in America, you're going to find so many different types because it's not just you have African Americans, you got Asian Americans, you have, I don't know, Germans, Irish, whatever. On top of that, you have I guess you could say mixes. Sometimes you have an American and uh, an Asian, or you have uh, African American and Asian. Like there's so many different combinations because here there's so many, um, so many. It sounds bad when I say it this way, but like there's so many different options here. Mm -hmm. It isn't strictly one skin tone, one, one of this, one of that. You know. Yeah, I do. I got you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually incorporated this tip in my characters file for my story, um, which I refer to as physical appearance. He has a, I didn't really know how to say light skinned because that's very subjective. It depends on what part of the world you're from. Light skin like, can mean a lot of things. Light is very <laughs> loose. Yeah, so I end, up, I end up just saying he has a light, a lightly tinted skin, <laughs> which is it's pretty iffy. But, um, I would say his... something like lightly tinted, and then you have a color there. Lightly tinted brown or lightly tinted uh, peach. Yeah, tan. Know. You, tan you might need a bit too. more adjectives. Yeah. Has dark brown hair. His hair is short. Gets messy from time to time. Piercings. Um, and, you know, the story doesn't have to fall upon these characteristics, but I done this before when I've used the characteristic with Cheyenne's dimples when I wrote dimple one thing that really stood out to the main character who is the reader was her dimples and another story project that I'm also working on was that one of the characters was going to have was going to be going to have heterochromia which means that oh. your that your irises are like two different colors and I actually I have a friend who's heterochromia and it's, it's a pretty good thing, and it's a pretty defining feature. You know, we mentioned earlier, unique characteristics, unique features. It's really something you don't have to write about, but it's, it, it's still pretty interesting to throw in there. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come out, like, later on this year, probably. Um, and I also, with the other characters, um, well, a lot of these are OCs that I've gotten – other members of what Pat to do because I didn't want to it was hard for me to differentiate from everyone so I end up asking other people to like throw in their OCs who could probably feature had to get their permission of course and so a lot of people there's Korean Americans that's someone who's from Los I must say Los America <laughs> Los, Los Angeles <laughs> um, somebody's Japanese native someone's that's multiple Australian natives someone's from Scotland um, JT's, he's, did I put that in, that, that Taiwan American? Taiwanese American, let's go. Taiwan <laughs> represent. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to really use that to like, the, the, now their place of origin isn't going to be what really defines them, but I feel like it would help create certain features for them, kind of affect the way they interact with things, that culture blockage. So to say. And then now, guys, we're on step 12, which is the final step, avoiding stereotypes. We could honestly spend hours on this alone. <laughs> we, I do have like another section in my notes to avoid stereotypical tropes or ideas. We will definitely address that in future episodes. But there are so many different tropes to address with this one. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure we're just going to highlight a couple of them. Mm. Yeah. So avoid stereotypes. Um, so firstly, there are the more harmful stereotypes, of course, which um, might be unintentional, but uh, depending on your ethnicity, because you might not be aware that it is, like, so to speak, offensive. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have the stereotype. I'm going to start with some racist ones because those are normally the harmless ones. People joke with these a lot, but they can come off as pretty demeaning. So as an Asian American, uh, especially Chinese American, I get a lot of Chinese people eating dog references, which I am not from China. So I, can I, I can't say anything about, I don't know, man. And it's just, why, why do you care that whether I eat a dog? I mean, actually, on second thought, I probably should care. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't mind, there are also um, African-American stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially now with the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement, and there's a lot of people thinking about it now, there's um, a pretty... Uh, not really, I'm not sure if common is the right word, but there is a frequent stereotype that African Americans are dangerous. They mm -hmm. are uh, very aggressive. Uh, I mean, Jay, do you have any in mind? I'm not really um, well versed in this. Oh, yeah, I could definitely throw my stereotypes out there. All right, so yeah, aggressive. Um, a lot of them don't have, like they say, a lot of. African Americans don't have fathers, or you know, oh, fathers that walked common. out. That's very common, actually. There's some, there's some funny ones like they joke around with, like eating watermelons and chick and fried chicken. For one, I do love watermelons. I can confirm that that's sometimes a true stereotype. But I actually don't like fried foods, so I would never eat a fried chicken. And I'm actually converting to vegetarianism as well. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My friend wants me to be a vegan, but I got to take it one step at a time. Baby steps, bro. Baby steps. Baby steps. Baby steps. <laughs> yeah. So stereotypes do avoid racial stereotypes because they can come off as offensive. Whether you think so or not, it's just best to respect the other cultures out there. Mm -hmm. um, and other stereotypes, um, we'll definitely Ooh. talk about this in depth, but like story plot wise stereotypes for example mm -hmm. i see so many people of people getting hit by a car <laughs> i mean <laughs> is this just something that everybody enjoys do you just like watching people get hit by cars i mean <laughs> Dude, that is so true <laughs> amnesia amnesia is another very common stereotype not oh definitely okay these aren't stereotypes these are more like very common tropes Mm. I guess, so to speak. So uh, racial stereotypes mm -hmm. and uh, very common tropes. Um, amnesia is a very, very common one that a lot of people use. So many people that it gets to the point that it's kind of annoying. Mm -hmm. There's also one, we talked about this in an earlier episode about faking your death. There's a lot yes. of like character deaths or fake deaths which doesn't have that much of a justification. Like there was one where, where the main character died and everyone's sad and, and then everyone pretty much moves on except for like the love interest who's like visiting the grave every weekend or something. And he's just like hiding in the shadows from behind the tree watching her from afar, which is where is this coming from? What precedented this? What led up to this? What is the justification from this? Nothing. And then I just feel, why? Mm. And it just doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. And then I lose the appeal for the story as well. Another one is um, family deaths. For some reason, everybody wants to start their story off with their parents being dead or like, like abusive parents. Yeah, that's good for character development. But having them dead completely is just like, why? It Shouldn't they be like in an yeah. orphanage too? It, it, it's, it's just wow. <laughs> There are other ones, there are gender-based stereotypes. Like some people like depict women, like especially a lot of male writers depict women as damsel in distress. Oh, that's a very common one too. Yeah. 
I'm like, I like actually, I feel a little guilty now because that's what my my, my project has <laughs> a little bit of damsel in distress in it. Shame on you. At least mine does. Well, it's kind of damsel in distress, except the damsel's the focus of the story. Oh, but then th- that's I feel like the somewhat of an is, excuse. Okay, so like it's it's. I mean, it's just like I felt like this was a very. I had like the, an ending in mind, but like I didn't know how I was gonna get to that ending in the first place. So I had to kind of create the damsel under the distress situation so that way they can get to that ending that i had in mind thank well, you I actually, you're terrible dude. <laughs> you're you're okay <laughs> i've actually avoided a stereotype in my project um one of the wet pot oh wet jesus wet yeah, pad yeah. writers <laughs> um who originally made she's of course female and she originally made a male oc but then I was like, well, out of all the people who made OC, she's the only female. So I allowed her to make a female OC, and she had some fun with it and everything. And in my mind, like one of the stereotypes, which is why I kind of hate Damsel in Distress, because I was raised primarily by my mother, who raised three kids on her own. And um, I like some, you could kind of say somewhat of a feminist in the, on the topic, but I threw in some like women empowerment on like one of the chapters. Because she's the only female out of six guys. Like, she has to stand out in some way. So I wanted her to kind of be like the mother figure. Mm-hmm. The same thing is with Katara from Avatar. She's a mother figure for Zook. Not, ooh. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> from Soka. No. No. <laughs> what are and you Toph. doing to me? Top two, she's a really good one. Even though she's blind. She, she's still good. She's one of the best air. Oh, I'm okay. Are you okay? <laughs> she's a really good earth bender. She's one of the best earth benders in the entire show. So I feel like when you kind of pick off these stereotypes, you're actually, this, it could actually be viewed as a development as well. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes women just don't, don't gotta depend on men all the time. I don't, I'm not very sometimes dependable. Sometimes women can whoop men's butts. Just like tough, just crush everyone. I know my grandma would like when I was younger. She would instantly curve a flip flop off a wall, and it would hit me, <laughs> which I, was not sounds, expected. <laughs> this sounds like a story on what pad? <laughs> <laughs> she just pew, just ninjas. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's stereotypes. That's avoiding stereotypes. No, and those if, are the if concepts it's... that we had for uh for the for in terms of like how you could create. Uh, character development in mm-hmm. within your story. Yes. Oh, yeah. And we have gone for a long time. We we we're all, we're we're halfway through at this point. Let's we can let's try to let's try to speed stuff up. You know. All right, speed up. All right, character arcs. Got any spills on it? So basically, character arcs are you can think of it as uh, tiny little sections within your um, like if you could cut up your story into these little little these little bits um of relative importance so if you think of it in terms of like a i talked about this early on i had the idea of thinking stories of uh, like a metro if you think if you're you're trying to get from point a to point b but if you encounter let's say you have to train change trains to get to another to get to another line that could mark a certain turning point i guess you could say in the path of the story or the path that you're taking for the, in terms of the Metro. So if, when you get off at a certain station to change trains, that could mark the change from an arc to another, because now you are changing directions, you are changing views. You have to now navigate to the next section before you can proceed down the story pathway. So if you think about it in, in, in that in that manner story arcs are in terms of character development you can turn them into areas in which you can show that the character is growing mm. um so it for in terms of character development it describes you know the inner and the outer journey of the character it could be physical mental emotional and it's just anything that the character experiences now Again, we we said we are gonna reference Avatar: The Last Airbender. A <laughs> you lot. thought you were done. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Jay, take it away. Zuko is an amazing example of character arcs and how his character changes 
throughout the entire series. All right. So as we already know, Zuko started off as a banished prince, and he he's as you and he's not really the center of Avatar, but he's a very interesting character on his own. And throughout the series, throughout each season, he goes from being a Avatar and honor obsessed maniac to like being the ally of the Avatar. And all this doesn't happen in just like one episode or like one or two episodes. This happened over a, the span of the series. This comes to show that like character arts could carry on for a certain period of time until you get the point that you're trying to get to. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of Zuko, uh, we're going to go into depth now and spoilers, but with <laughs> Zuko, especially in the first episode, he is hell bent on catching the avatar and bringing him to his father on the sole motivation of, I need to restore my honor. I need to be worthy of coming back again. And if you think about it, he's so blinded by this motivation, this goal that he doesn't realize that at that time, because nobody was certain that the avatar was still alive, his father practically sent him on a, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Mission? Uh, not really a mission, but like a suicide mission in a way, because he did not expect anything to come out of it because nobody knew what happened to the avatar. It's been a hundred years since he was last seen, right? Mm -hmm. So he, it, it, was, it was hopeless. It was, there was, he expected nothing from Zuko, but Zuko, he still had faith that he could find the avatar and all that. And as a result, he does, and he is hell bent on just chasing him down, which he does a very fabulous job of. But eventually you have, um, uh, if you think about it from the hero's journey, you can imagine that there's another person who's undergoing it as well, that being Zuko and his mentor, who's constantly there educating him and teaching him is his uncle Iroh and his uncle's always talking about how you should think of it from a different perspective instead of focusing strictly on I must restore my honor why don't you think of it this way or approach it from a different angle and so Iroh is just constantly providing all these different perspectives and if you think about it from season one it's a lot of uh ignorance he doesn't want to listen he really couldn't care he's just so focused on that one idea that he is not willing to listen to anyone else then you approach season uh book two uh earth and then you see him he has in a way he hasn't completely abandoned it but he's preparing to um and he's starting to listen to he's starting to listen more and he's trying to find his own path aside from honor he's trying to find his own way in the world and by the end of book two and into book three, he decides he knows what he wants to do with his life. Forget about honor. He wants to make his own path. And so you see him in, from the very beginning. He just wants to please his father. He wants to do and accomplish all these different things. But eventually you see him detach. Instead of trying to please his father, he learns how to please himself. And by doing so, he turn, he undergoes an enormous personality change. Like if you look at him from the beginning of the series and look at him at the end, they're two completely different people, two completely different personalities, different mindsets. Uh, even their fighting styles change. And if you think about it as they, as, as anyone, even in real life or in the story, but even in real life too, as time progresses, we all change in a matter of speaking. What we are, what we were yesterday, and what we are today are somewhat different because we are still, we're constantly learning something, whether it's as it's, it's whether it's so small or so, or ridiculously big, we learn something. And the, the JT of tomorrow is going to be vastly different from what happened uh, a couple of days ago, because we are constantly growing. We're constantly changing. And in one way or another, it's, a very interesting thing to think about whether you don't think you especially for people who think they don't change that much who knows you might that 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 view might change too <laughs> and frankly these character arts actually help as we mentioned in the steps above not above you can't see what i see but before <laughs> Um, these your character is going to have flaws and these character arts is going to help them overcome those flaws like for my project, 
the many projects that I have. Jesus. As I mentioned before, he's a good dancer, but not a good singer. He's just a trainee. He wants to become a idol, follow his role models and stuff like that. And his like throughout the entire story, like when you mentioned the metro station, each chapter each chapter tra- <laughs> the country is showing. Each chapter, he is stopping at these different metro stations. There's these different conflicts that he has to overcome to reach a bigger goal. Like, huh, I could actually pull up something really quickly. Um, so, for instance, in the beginning, he's all along. All he has is his senior, who I can't, you know, spill the beans on. But all he has is her. And she basically is like a mother figure for him when he leaves America to start training under the company. And as the story goes on, I mentioned things like, okay, in one of the chapters, he has to learn how to make a track. He has to go to rehearsals at one point. Basically, he undergoes what idols would go, like what idols would have to go through prior to the final resolution. And that's that development that we're trying to get at. He's going to become a better singer. He's going to do this stuff. He's going to overcome his personality weaknesses thanks to his friends like JT, who actually goes under a different name. But, you know. Yeah, so character arts are really important. And they really guide your character. It guides the plot of the story pretty well as well. As well, so, yeah. It helps them become much more enriched yeah. people what he said. Um, and so on the idea of changing, uh, we're going to jump back to the hero's journey, which we talked about a long while back. And I'm just going to kind of briefly rush through them and just quickly talk about like character development in terms of the hero's journey. Um, so there are 12 point plot points within the hero's journey. Um, you have the ordinary, you begin in the ordinary world, the status quo where the, main character lives pretty much content with his life. And he's just, and it's just, everything is normal. Everything is ordinary. There's nothing special yet. And he's content with that. Then you have the call to adventure, which is plot point two, where, and then where something, uh, something occurs and that, and that, that balance inside the ordinary world becomes, uh, becomes uh, warped and then that imbalance occurs. Uh, If we think of Harry Potter, he lives with the Dursleys and his call to adventure was the letter, All right? And then you have the refusal of the call, which is plot point number three. This one is um, sometimes optional. It doesn't always appear, but, this is, but it does happen sometimes where the main character doesn't really want to deal with it. He is content with the ordinary world. He doesn't want to leave it and he doesn't want anything to do with this call to adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in a way Harry Potter had it and that would be his uh, aunt and uncle taking him far away to hide from the letters that keep coming. Uh, and then you have number four, the meeting of the mentor. And this meeting of the mentor is they are going to help and teach the main character as they are about to progress into the, the special world, I guess you could call it. And so meeting the mentor. Now the mentor is going to start educating them. They're going to start teaching them of everything they need to know as they enter the special world. Okay. Mm-hmm. Plot point number five is crossing the threshold. Now we are moving between two different worlds. We are moving from the ordinary world to the special world. And in this special world, the main character has no idea what's going on and he is learning everything from scratch. He's exposed to this completely new world. In a way of, of speaking, you can think for Harry Potter, this is either the moment he's entering Diagon Alley or he's um, going on to Hogwarts or he's on the train to Hogwarts. Uh, it's just that certain period. He is now moving into the world of magic. He has no idea what is happening. You see Ron Weasley pretending to know that he knows magic and accidentally turns his frog. He tries to turn his frog yellow or something. And then you have Hermione. He actually knows what she's doing and she does it amazingly. And then we get to plot point six test allies and enemies. Now this is the part where the MC needs to under- learn the rules of this special world, figure out who's on whose side, who is friendly, who is hostile, who is, um, who is he gonna end up, uh, who, who might become obstacles, who can help you overcome those obstacles. And with tests, you have the world constantly 
checking up on the main character, making sure he understands how the special world works. Now, after that, then we start the approach. And in a way, you can also think of it as the approach to the innermost cave. So now we are going deeper and deeper into the special world, and it's getting more and more and more dangerous. And so as a result, he is being, he, this is kind of like, it's just, the ball is rolling now and everything is starting to happen and we're not sure where this is going, but we can feel the tension building. Number eight, ordeal, death and rebirth. Of course, not literal at all. Um, you have the hero he en who encounters and kind of fights against the villain for the first time and he, encount and he f sees the, the, the antagonist for the first time and now, and he doesn't know how to defeat him. And of course he will lose. But the villain is somewhat injured for now and he retreats, which gives the, um, the main character uh, the time to, uh, I guess, um, how, should, how do I say it? Now it gives him time to regroup, reform, re-strategize, figure out how to beat the villain the second time through, which leads to number nine, reward, seizing the sword. So now this is this time he is coming back and he is starting to, um, uh, he's getting ready for the final battle for, um, uh, against the antagonist. And then number 10, the road back, you have the hero. Now he's moving from the special world back to the normal world because now his normal world is about to be affected by the villain, the antagonist, or the effects of the special world. Then you have 11, resurrection which is the climax of the story, the ultimate battle where the hero finally faces off against the villain and he struggles through it. Again, we talked again in the past about how the antagonist is powerful and he's an, another obstacle that the hero must overcome. And so in any case, the hero will win this battle with the new skills that he's developed, the new allies he has made, um, the items that he has obtained along the way to help overcome the antagonist. And at the end, you have 12, return with, uh, with the elixir. Now you have Harry Potter. He's coming back home, but now he is a completely different person. He knows far more now. He, under, he knows magic. He knows, um, he knows this. He knows that. He understands this. He just fought um, inner demons or something like that, or he, the main, or the hero, uh, has, he's, he has now come home with, new experience he has seen a different part of the world that he didn't get to see back in the beginning when he was in the normal world he is back in the normal world he's back in the place where he has started but he himself is not the same person that was once there and so now he is living in the ordinary world but now is a different person and so that is essentially the hero's journey um thank you and so with the hero's journey there are generally three character archetypes and this, even though the hero's journey, the, coin, the, the term was coined in 1949, it originates all the way back in ancient Greek theater. So uh, if we think, let's see, Theseus and the Minotaur. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we think in terms of the main character archetypes, you have the protagonist, the good guy, the hero, right? The story revolves around them and they're trying to achieve their goal. And it's told from their perspective. Then you have the antagonist, the bad guy, the villain, and he's in contrast to the protagonist. And in order for the hero to succeed, they must be defeated. So in Theseus versus the Minotaur, protagonist is Theseus, antagonist is the Minotaur. In a way, you can also think of it as the king as well. And then there's a third one who is not, who, who's not as focused, but is very crucial to the point is the romantic other, which is essentially the love interest of the hero. And so the romantic other is completely dependent on the hero's desires. And remember back then, this is a patriarchy. It is somewhat um, male uh, superiority in a way. Mm. And so the romantic other is normally a female, the love interest of the hero, and she is completely dependent on the hero's desires. And, but she serves as the inspiration and sometimes potential aid for the hero. And so this would be a, a ride in a, I think, the princess who gives him the ball of string to help him find his way out of the labyrinth. And in a way, this romantic other functions as the hero's reward in the end. 
And this is what motivates the hero to undergo all of these um, trials. And of course, there are so many different genres of, of uh, the hero's journey. And there's so many different examples, Lord of the Rings, uh, Harry Potter, uh, Percy Jackson. There are so many, man. There's Star Wars. Many. Star Wars. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this is a lot in terms of content for character, de character development. And so we're just going to quickly do some quick writing exercises that you can use to help flesh out your characters as well. We have a character questionnaire. If you're interested, feel free to email us and we will be glad to send you some questions. You don't have to use the questions that we used per se, but you just ask yourself constantly, just all the constantly ask yourselves questions about your character so you understand your characters more in depth. So ask yourself lots of characters, about, uh, ask yourself a lot of questions about your characters. Mm -hmm. Um, you can even write one page character descriptions Just sit down and just write uh, one write one page about your character his back their background their their hobbies their interests um, or you can even write an interior monologue as to like how do they think how do they behave what are they thinking about what are they how do they think in reaction to this certain event you have to ask you have to be able to ask yourself all these different questions to be able to um, understand your character to its fullest potential. And there's honestly no way around it. You just have to play around with them, envision it, and just see it through. Question, all right, so right now we'll do a quick, we'll do the questionnaire. Um, Jay has a bunch of questions. He's gonna give me a character, and depending on the character, I'll just whip something up. All right, all right, all right. You give me any, you give me anyone, any, any anyone. All right, all right. So I was gonna go to twice, actually. I'm Please like hmm. twice. <laughs> that's like the only K-pop group I really like invest time in. It's you can pick anyone, but Boy. I should try to know them. Try to know them. Um, let's go with Jung Yun. Jung Yun, twice. Jung -Yun. Yes, I'm gonna spare you. Uh, Jung Yun, should I create a new character or should I just do it like? Uh, Art of the Con, Jung Yun. A uh, new character. New I want character. to see what you got. <laughs> okay. Um, can you give me a plot? Sure. Um, so this is, is, we also plan on doing something like this in the future. Maybe every 10th episode, we play a little game where we create little plot ideas, and then we have to create something from those, and then just like create new ideas to come up with different story ideas. So this is just a f character version, but... All right, Jung Yun, give me a plot so I can use her in it. All right, so the the setting is going to be in a supernatural world, supernatural dominant world, with a sci-fi. Can you can you specify what you mean by supernatural? All right, or, so you got, want, or is that up to my imagination? Um, I'll specify because there's superhero supernatural, and then there's like yeah, yeah, monster yeah. supernatural. I'm going with monster supernatural. What do you mean by monster supernatural? Like vampires, werewolves. Okay. okay. You know, the, the, the basic stuff. Uh, let's see, she's a high school student. She's just starting. Oh, you're going to give me more. Okay, character description. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, monster. Jung Yun. Okay. Mm, uh, monster. Monster, 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 monster. Uh, monster. I can't think of monster. I, there's like a lot of vampire and werewolf stories out there, and those are just so boring and stereotypical. What should I do? Oh yeah, I'm Greek getting, goddess. Mm, not really. Um, I'm thinking this is similar to what I have now, but basically, I want to do some. She's a high school student. Okay, mm -hmm. she's a high school student. All right, I have a good idea of how I want to roll with that. All right, I think I have a decent idea of what I might want to do, but mm -hmm. this is just for the character only so I can flesh out the details of the plot later if I feel like it. So mm -hmm. fire away. All right. Questions, let's go. All right, character's name. Do you want to change her name? Um, so let's make it, uh, uh, let's see. So her name will be Yu Jong Yong, of course, but her real name is um, 
I, I know it. Kyungwon. So Yu Kyungwon is her birth name, but she goes by Jungwon, of course. Okay, okay. So it's okay. that piece of realism. Yeah. And what does she look like? Uh, I won't think of it right now, but looks like the idol. But of course, high school. All right, all right, all right, all right. These are terrible questions. <laughs> you can come up with your own. Okay, cool. Forget these, cause ugh, oh, I'm no. interested now. Okay, where is her supernatural ability? She doesn't have mustard? a. She doesn't. Uh, so this is a monster thing. She does not have a supernatural ability. However, she stuck. Her parents are archaeologists, and the whole idea of the plot is during her summer vacation, she goes with her parents. Uh, let's say Egypt. She goes with her parents to Egypt. Her home is in South Korea. And they find a, I don't know. Let's say they're, they're searching through the tomb. Let's maybe in the Valley of the Kings or something like that. Mm. Uh, and then while they're digging, earthquake hits, uh, ground underneath, Jongyeon collapses. She falls through the hole. And that is her call to adventure. She is being forced along into the tomb. And she can't really get out. And her pants can't, can't really get in. I'll think of an idea for that later. Okay. To justify that. Mm -hmm. All right. So off to a good start. Off to a good start. <laughs> Characters, let's go. See, this see. is about the character, okay? This is about the character. All right. All right. So we got the call to adventure. She fell into the hole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you say that's her traumatic event or she have any it's other It's not going to be a traumatic event. Sorry, okay. uh, this won't be a traumatic event because this is going to be supernatural monster world, right? So mm -hmm. not really necessarily something with mummies, but I am thinking when she's down in those chambers, she comes across something. That would be her traumatic, that would be a bit of a traumatic experience. She finds this creature down there. She has no idea what it is, but what to do with that. Um, Let's see. Traumatic. So no, her falling down in down the hole is not a traumatic experience, but it's what down there that she experiences is what traumatizes her. Okay. I'm so what? That would actually lead to my other question. What is her predisposition, and how does it change from falling into that hole? Predisposition, as in, like, how is she like before? Yes. Uh. So, from my understanding of Jong Yun, I think her high school personality would be something like she's a very uh, confident kind of person. Very, she knows what she wants. She knows uh, how how to achieve it. Um, she has a, uh, a she has somewhat an interest in archaeology as her parents going to explore and find these uh, I, these these archaeological discoveries and these creatures and she enjoys traveling with her parents all over the world to find these uh uh these treasures i guess you could say and maybe if i wanted to i might make them famous archaeologists who finds these big discoveries and donates to uh well-known museums maybe the met or the london museum or mm. uh or the louvre i'm not sure but they might be big namers. I'm not sure if I want to do that. So her predisposition, uh, she, she, she's very knowledgeable. She knows all these things. She knows what she wants. She's confident in her skills. But after her encounter with whatever it was that was lurking in the tombs, um, now she's traumatized. She's like paranoid. She thinks something's out to, ooh, there we go, paranoid. She's thinking something is out to get her. This might be some horror story trope or something. Mm -hmm. um, something is out to get her. She can't see it. It's like in the corner of her eye, but whenever she turns, it is not there anymore. Ooh. Yeah. Paranoia is a really good thing. Well, That's, at least in a story. <laughs> if, if you know how to write paranoia, then that would be a fun one to listen to. But yes, mm -hmm. they're generally a happy person, very outgoing, very friendly person. But then after she goes in there, she's now paranoid and she isolates herself from the rest of the world. She doesn't know what... She, what is going to happen next, and she's scared. Mm. Now, it's just basically polar opposite of what she was in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. What are her friends like? What are her friends like? So, of course, this yeah. is probably going to be some select few from uh, from Twice. 
Uh, mm. uh, let's go. Nayeon, Jihyo. Maybe we can throw in Sana. And okay. I don't want to make it too many. Just like a couple should be. Two or three might be fine. Yeah. Friends. They're also outgoing. Um, they, 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 they love to have fun. Karaoke. Goof off. It's just your normal stereotypical teenage they like having they like to have fun maybe one or two of them have boyfriends uh yeah but into the whole she's traumatized by or she's she comes paranoid at the same way she saw okay so and this also raises another good question is what kind of story is this going to be not for characters but what is this story going to be for is it going to be about jongyeon or is it going to be about or is it going to be like a Jong Young ex-reader? Because then that will change how the story is written too. And then I have to would, how do I add this reader character? Yeah, it would actually change like the point of view as well too. Mm-hmm. Depending on how the description is. But if it's not yeah. a reader insert story, then it's most likely going to be first person from the perspective of Jong Young. So then that way you can really get that sense of paranoia out after the tomb arc. In a way, I guess you can call it an arc. Okay. Yeah, give me some more questions. Um, tell me a bit about now. I'm really interested, curious about that monster. Does does she interact? Like aside from her paranoia that she thinks she sees things, does she at times truthfully see whatever she saw down there, or is it just her paranoia? Like is she prone? Is like after seeing the monster, is she really prone to illusions now? Uh, so there's not so much illusions, but it's more like she doesn't know what's in there she hears something she's there's something in the darkness with her she can't put her finger on it she doesn't know what it is mm. there's something in there with her she can't see it um her being an archaeologist uh the child of an archaeologist i would assume she would come well prepared she might have a flashlight she is trying to get the upper hand she's trying to find her way back out right and so small flashlight probably uh cargo short a cargo short kind of pocket so maybe the flashlight isn't going to be very big so when she sends it around the room the light is either going to be rather weak or it's going to be small it has a very small cone of uh, mm. of light so so the question was how does she react to the monster when she sees it yes she never sees the monster if she does it's always barely like maybe she'll see like a bit of movement from a behind a rock or she'll hear some rocks move, but she can't, she doesn't ever see the monster. Uh, I was watching A Quiet Place, the, the second one. Ooh. And I, although it's a very, very good concept, I think the problem that with it is that in the very, very beginning, when the child dies, as pointed out in the trailer, is... The biggest problem is they, they show you the monster already. So now there is no room for imagination because I think the biggest fear of any human is the fear of the unknown. That's why we are afraid of the dark. That's why we are afraid of, that's, that's where fear is based off of. We, it is based off of the unknown. We don't know what is there. So I think the longer we can keep the, um, the creature from being noticed by the readers or the audience, and the more scary and the more mysterious that it is. Some horror films in the past where it's like, which were similar, she thinks they're being, she's being followed, but then turns out it is just invisible and all it can, you want to hold its potential until the very end so that way you don't really know what it is capable of, mm. right? So she's paranoid, she doesn't know what is there, but she can feel it, she's, she knows it's there, it's somewhere in there. She can't identify it. Nobody believes her. And then she starts going crazy. So I guess it's also kind of like the Invisible Man in a way. Ooh, that was but nice. I haven't seen it. I'm going to be oh. honest. I am not a fan of horror f- films because, again, overactive, overactive imagination. So that actually might make it worse. Now, what would be the builder? Where, where are we go- After she goes in that hole, what's happening that's going to lead to that climax? And also, what would that climax be? Okay, so of course it's going to be, um, it's going to split into several sections. It's going to be, she starts in Korea, you get the idea of what is her normal life like. She's hanging out with her friends, she goes to school, she knows 
how we get to know what her day to day life is. And summer break is coming up. That's the whole, that's where everything starts. And then you, you get the plans of all the other friends and what they're going to be doing. And she's basically, she's going off to, I'm just going to go ahead and say Egypt for now, but, um, She's going to go with her archaeologist parents to, to do some stuffs and some diggings. And that's what's going to lead to the tomb. And after the tomb thing, when she's super paranoid, is she's going to come out. So she's terrified. She's frightened. She's traumatized. She is like completely out of it. So she gets sent back home. And what I want to do with that maybe is her friends are trying to help her out too mm. like maybe they're calling her on or they're facetiming her or they're actually there with her i'm i don't know how that's going to play out but she is scared out of her mind she doesn't know what is happening right and mm. so maybe i really don't know what to do with this because it's supernatural which means anything could happen and i we need and i need to give it like a basis like what's so special about egypt um uh, in the tomb and i also need to find a way out so she can overcome this thing you know this i don't know how would any... you appro- i don't know how would you approach it oh, yeah, approach ideas, you, can add, you can add anything you want to this this is just me spouting off ideas well with the aspect that she fell in the hole she doesn't know like she didn't see anything but that fear of the unknown creates hallucinations gets her paranoia so what I don't want to say I don't want to say hallucinations because then it might seem like schizophrenia, and I yeah. don't want it to be schizophrenia. I want it to be there's something there. I oh, got you, got you. Well, it takes more than just hallucinations to c- categorize schizophrenia, though. But the common yeah. person doesn't know that, so I get what you mean. Yeah. If you don't have doesn't anything, know. you don't have to think about it. You can go ahead and ask a different question. Maybe that'll help me think about it. But I don't know. All right. Just if you want to add something like an idea, just pop it in. Gotcha. But what about any medical conditions? Anything that could, like, kind of increases the terror that's causing her to react the way she is? I think, uh, like, medically speaking, before the whole thing, she's medically sound. She's all right. No psychological anything. But maybe what we, what I could do is um, the parents think she's hallucinating or she is, like, tra- I don't know. They think she's she's making something up. I'm not sure. But she, they basically, they get her meds. She doesn't want to take them, of course. But when she finally does take them, let's say uh, muscle, it's a muscle relaxant, something to help her relax, or sleeping pills, right? But what it actually ends up doing is it ends up paralyzing her. Now she can't move, and she, but she's still conscious. She's still thinking. She is still paranoid of what might be out there. And then there definitely, you can probably spend one chapter just her lying in her bed. She can't sleep, but she can't really move either. And she's just stuck there. And she can hear something, maybe, or she uh, sees something out of the corner of her eye, but she can't move herself to see it, the whole thing. Mm. You know, I don't know how I would really incorporate like a horror aspect into this because it sounds like this creature is only after her. But I could expand it to like, eventually her friends get caught up in it. Yeah, I, I don't just, know what to do with that. Because I was, that was just thinking about that. So like maybe it's like, um, like maybe it's not just out to get her, but because it's sort of in her mind and, you know, she's constantly thinking about it. Maybe she'll think that, okay, Ooh. maybe it's not out to get me. Maybe it's out for my friends too, because it can't get to her or something like that. I got, I got, a, I got a very, very good idea now. Okay. The Billy. monster, the monster. Mm. She can't see it because it's in, the, it's in the corner of her eye, correct? Mm-hmm. The reason why she can't see it is because it's in the corner of her eye. She literally cannot see it, okay? You ta- we said it was in her mind, right? And she sees something, right? Or she reads some passage. And basically, the act of doing such thing allows it to enter her mind, in, in a way of speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, the eyes are not the windows of the souls; they are the doors. Ooh, doesn't that sound awesome? Okay, so and then using that, basically, it allows whatever consciousness or whatever living in that text or whatever to enter her. Right now, here's the fun bit: she can't see it, but she can feel its presence. It's somewhere nearby, and that nearby being her. That's why she, only she can feel it; nobody else can. Now, Mm -hmm. when she transports home, gets transported home, and her friends get mixed up into it, when she rests, 
that's when the creature comes out. And I'm not sure if I wanted to have a physical manifestation where it comes, literally exits her body and causes ruckus or something, or it possesses her. But in any case, let's say her friends like decide to take a rotation. Each day, one of them comes and watches over her, make sure she's all right, right? Mm. Ooh, maybe I could make it, make it become a physical manifestation. And she is like a host to it. Ooh. Because with the idea with the muscle relactants and the, uh, and, the, and the sleeping pills that don't have an effect is she's paralyzed in her bed. She can't move. She can't see anything. She feels its presence, right? But mm-hmm. it's the presence when she, it's outside of her body. It is consuming one of her friends. Uh-huh. It's consuming mm-hmm. one of her friends. And she sees it in the reflection of the man- window or a mirror or something. Okay. And she just has to feign sleep or she just passes out from the sight of it or something. But the point is when she wakes up, it's gone. Her friend that was there is also gone and she is scared as hell. Right. Look at that. We just okay. created okay. a plot. <laughs> we just created a character that the plot revolves around. This is just us spouting ideas. Ooh, Dang. Yeah, look at this. Hope, if uh, anybody's <laughs> interested in writing this story, hit us up. We would love to give you the <laughs> full rundown of what we think could happen. We oh. actually should be closing out pretty soon. We should actually stop soon. This is a getting really really long <laughs> yeah right, this was just an exercise that we were trying out and we were just having fun with and we've more or less hit the end of the podcast already um just like last time good vibe check let's check up on some good vibe checks from last week you know nobody mm-hmm. said anything on the youtube but you know some people said some stuff on our watt pads what pond what pond we said a lot of people got some albums a lot of people did get albums. That's right. Yeah. Somebody is got happy no for jams. it. Yeah. Got No Jams got a new one. Got, mm-hmm. a, got a Stray Kids album. Oh, and an Itsy one. The It's Me one. Oh. Let's when see. the night is I- over, has a new home office set up. They have a new monitor as well. Ooh. Yeah. Starlight Up My Days. He's pretty, where well, they're pretty excited for Chief Friends Comeback. Apple. I am too. That. <laughs> That's a theory. That that needs a theory. Oh, <laughs> more and more people are excited about that. <laughs> I just wish more people interact. Yeah, mm-hmm. please put a comment. Please, please send us something. We would love to hear from people. Please. Wait, did you got any good vibes? Anything good happened to you, JT? Uh, good vibes. I am on my. I just finished my last class. I have a final exam on Monday. So. Ooh. Yikes. <laughs> we will be praying for you, bro. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Molecular biology and genetics. Ew. It God. does not sound as fun. As it, it, it does it not does. sound fun. <laughs> it doesn't at all. Let's see. Uh, for me, I got like three classes left after this term, so I'm going to graduate in January with wait, my what? associates. Yeah. I go to community oh. college right now, so I'm gonna really I'm gonna graduate in January, and that summer I transfer to another university, also in Georgia, because I just say tuition sucks. Come to my college. What What did I just say? What did I just say? Come up here, and we can jam like every day. <laughs> but anyway, all right. back on track. <laughs> anyway. Like, comment, subscribe if you're listening to this on YouTube. Uh, Feel free to donate to us on Venmo. I don't think I've been seeing much activity on there in terms of that. Of course, continue to support us. Share this with your friends. Put this on your bios or conversations or just help us spread the word because we believe that the more people who can hear this, um, the more people that we can help. Um, And we just hope that you guys can continue to support us, provide us with ideas. Um, We're going to continue researching different ideas and concepts, and we hope to convey our uh, thoughts and opinions to you. Yeah. Places where you can contact us from, you can reach out to us on, um, on, uh, our, through our website, which is kfic.wixsite.com slash kfic-cafe. Um, haven't been to Aritua for a while. Um, (laughs) 
but uh, you have our blog up or our newsletter up. If you want to keep in touch, feel free to email us and we'll include you in our newsletter as well, um, and which will include uh, links to our most recent uh, podcasts. You can feel free to reach out to us on, on Wattpad or Instagram. Instagram, you can find us as uh, KFET Cafe. And through Wattpad, you can find me, JT, on K of Pop Once. You can find me, J, uh, K Popper underscore Writer 17. Uh, you can find this podcast on our YouTube channel, which we upload manually, or on Anchor, which distributes it to a bunch of other platforms, which includes Overcast, Pocket Casts, Breaker, Radio Public, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and I think Google Play now. Feel free to reach out to us. We had a wonderful time just ranting about this kind of stuff. And we just love talking about this because so many ideas can just come from it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just to say that you're the only ones who use this information because I, we're, we're definitely using the information because we're actually researching it mm -hmm. as we like, you know, it spilled the information out to you guys. So when we're researching, we're incorporating that into our own works, our own individual projects. So this is actually a learning experience for us as well. Um, we appreciate all of you guys who stuck around to the end. You Thank know. you for putting up with all of this. <laughs> yeah, unlike last time, this wasn't as chaotic. <laughs> yeah, but it is probably longer. Yeah, but, you know, thank you guys for supporting us. Hope you all have a beautiful day, amazing day. It's pretty sunny over here in Georgia. It is uh, somewhat cloudy over here where I am, North Carolina. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> this is Jay signing off. And this is JT signing off. We hope you enjoyed a wonderful time at the Cafe Cafe, and we will see you next time. Do, do, do.